So I think it, higher level, just um, in terms of the, the content and as well as how quickly the classes go. My program was a year and a half. You spend four years undergraduate. So those classes, looking back, they felt that they were moving at a slower pace than my graduate um, class was. And I think that that's what I mean by high, higher level. Essentially, I think you just, you know, you need to keep up with the content. Um, it would be easier to fall behind in graduate classes than it would undergrad, in my own opinion. But with that being said, I, I really enjoyed how my graduate classes focused on the writing. There's less tests, there's less quizzes. Um, and again, that focusing on writing and strengthening my writing skills has really helped me in my career. I think that was one of the most valuable things that I can take from my master's program. This is the Public Health Millennial Career Stories podcast, where you'll hear about diverse career stories, career strategies, get tips, and learn from others to help you in your public health career journey. If you want to learn about public health, public health careers, or just hear public health stories, stay tuned because you won't want to miss this. Welcome to the Public Health Millennial Career Stories podcast, episode number 76. Hi everyone, Omari Richens here. Thank you all so much for joining me today. Be sure to follow me on the PH Millennial. Before, be sure to go and get subscribe to my email list. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast, leave a like, share with a friend, leave a review. It greatly helps the show get out and help more public health people, which is all, which is all we are about here, just helping more public health people figure out and navigate their way in public health. I really enjoyed today's conversation. It's been someone that I've been connected with online for a bit, and we finally got to e-connect and really just dive into her story, and I'm excited to share with you all, and I know you all are going to take some value from it as well. So be sure to do all those things, and we have some exciting things coming into the future, so just make sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on that as well. Peace. Today, we have a public health professional and public relations freelancer. She got her bachelor's degree in public health and women's and gender studies at the College of Charleston, then got her master of public health at the University of New England. She works as a program associate at ABIM Foundation, I don't know if you say ABIM, as well as freelance healthcare public relations specialist at Comprehensive Care Center. We have Kate Comedy, MPH. Welcome to the show. Hi, Amari. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here with you and I'm such a fan. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad to connect finally, like online, I guess. And it is really nice to put a, a face and like some personality behind the emails and, and the different communications that we have had in the past. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So how, how are you doing and how have you been coping during these times? I'm doing well. Yeah. Um, I'm like many organizations. We I have been working from home essentially since um, the beginning of the pandemic. So it's been an interesting transition. Um, but I, I'm doing well. How, how are you? I'm, I'm also doing well. I got my uh, little green smoothie thing that I made here because my kale is going to go bad. So uh, <laughs> <Yum>. <laughs> just having a very relaxing uh, day. So I, I kind of complain. I'm just always happy to hear new stories in public health for like so weird, weird, like, I don't like really doing the editing and the back end stuff, but talking to people, oh, I'm, I'm all about that. So I'm, I'm yes. excited for this as always. Uh, so, so tell me, how do you identify? And then tell us a little bit about your personal background. Sure. So I identify with she, her pronouns. Um, as you said, I am a program associate at ABIM Foundation. Professionally, I consider myself a public health professional. I currently live in Philadelphia where I work. However, I am from New Jersey and um, was raised there. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you for that little synopsis of your life. And we're going to dig a little bit more into your public health career in a little bit. But before we do that, what does public health mean to you? Yeah, this is a really loaded question. And it's, it's hard to summarize um, in, in one answer. I think to me, um, public health is is essential to our communities. Having a strong public health workforce means we have a strong uh, foundation of a society. And I think that people who were not aware of public health prior to the pandemic may realize that now, hopefully. Um, so as, as a public health professional, it means everything to me because it is my career. However, more importantly, as a person in the world, public health is, is very important to me because we, we need a strong public health workforce in order to have healthy communities. 
Yeah, absolutely. It's all, all about the communities. We we gotta we gotta get get the workforce, the infrastructure, everything in place so that we can do our best to to do the work for the community. So thank you for that. Um, so you got your bachelor's degree in public health and women and gender studies at the College of Charleston. So was what was the thought process for that? Did you go in as both a public health and women's and gender studies major? Yeah, good question. So I actually did not go in with any sort of major when I was in high school and essentially completing high school, I definitely had an interest in healthcare. Um, I was interested in the clinical side of healthcare. I was also interested in um, what I now know as public health. However, at that time, I didn't necessarily know what public health was. So I, I took an introduction to public health class my freshman year of college, and I essentially never looked back. I loved all of the public health classes. I declared my major right away. Um, I couldn't wait to just dive deeper into those classes. So I, I majored in public health, and then the minor in women and gender studies came similarly to how I had an interest in healthcare in high school. I also had an interest in uh, feminism, women and gender studies, and um, I wanted to move forward largely with public health, but also expand my knowledge um, in in women's and gender studies. So I, I combined the two of them. Okay, okay, awesome. So so tell me, what was that that point in your public health classes in your freshman year that I was like, oh my God, I want to do this. What, what, what was that for you? Yeah, it, it really was my introduction to public health class um, because since that class was such a broad overview of the subject of public health, I remember thinking to myself, wow, I love all of this content. I felt like public health is a place that we, we know that people who major in public health do take clinical tracks. However, for uh, me, I thought, wow, this is a place where I can become an expert in the healthcare system and not necessarily um, be serving clinically. And I loved everything that came after that class, I would say that, you know, there was no particular moment within the intro to public health class that made me think I'm, I'm, I'm going to move forward with this. It was just being in the class overall and learning all of the content and just learning what public health was for the first time. Okay. That's awesome. And uh, I'm, I'm jealous. Uh, lucky you, because I wish I had like any kind of public health class to know about public health and undergraduate, but uh, that, that's awesome. I'm glad that it led you down that path. And I definitely think it is so fascinating. And, and a lot of the times, as you said, like people are thinking of a clinical health, even in public health. And I think there's just so much in public health that you can do. So I'm glad that you're with us in this public health world. Um, so so during, during your time in undergrad, you were a communications coordinator and research assistant at the College of Charleston's Women's Health Research Team. So how do you get that? And then what were you doing it? Right. Yeah. Um, that being a part of the College of Charleston Women's Health Research Team was such a great experience. Now it feels like a very long time ago, but I still consider that experience to be really foundational in um, public health, in my experience as a public health professional. So as I said, I had the minor in women and gender studies. And to complete that minor, I had to participate in an internship. And that was my gateway into uh, joining the College of Charleston Women's Health Research Team. So um, essentially, I did stay on past my internship just because I really um, enjoyed being a part of it. But that I would highly suggest that any public health undergrad or graduate students, if, you, if they have the opportunity to do so, that they join a research team, because that was a great way uh, to even just to sit back, even if you weren't participating in all of the different research studies, just to sit back and watch the process was really helpful. You really do get a grounding and understanding of how public health research works. Um, so of course, being a women's health research team, all of those studies were focused on women's health research. And it was also very interesting because uh, um, many studies were specifically in Charleston, the city that I went to school in, or larger than that in the state of South Carolina. So you really do get an understanding not only for the research process, but for a lot of the um, health issues that are focused in the state that you're in or in the city that you're in. And then also, when did women and gender studies, like when did, when did the thought behind getting that minor come, come into play? Um, that I do think that similar to how I decided to major in public health pretty quickly in my college career. I feel similar to that about my minor. I, ch I chose it simply because I learned that it was a major and I, again, had interest in those classes. So 
I would, I would say I probably just picked that minor around the same time I picked my major. So towards the end of my freshman year, um, I felt pretty confident about these are two subjects I'm interested in and I would like to learn more. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you for sharing that. I also saw on your LinkedIn profile, you got a bachelor's degree in public health at, I'm going to butcher this, but University de Glisto de, de Modena e Reggio Emilia. Very you, good. I'll take like a five out of 10 for that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but tell me, what, what, what is that about? So essentially that was my study abroad experience. Um, so Again, as I would suggest any students being involved in a research team, if they have the opportunity, um, anyone who has the opportunity to study abroad, I, I would highly suggest that experience for various reasons, even to anyone, not even people who are interested in public health. But I think that there's a lot of value in enrolling in a study abroad program. I did choose my program specifically because they offered public health courses. And I just thought that that was such a great experience because first of all, you meet public health students from other universities. So I was connecting with students and hearing about their public health programs, you know, um, in various places throughout the U.S. And that, that's great just in terms of networking and hearing about different experiences that they have. And then on top of that, you're also in a different country. So you're learning about a different health system. Um, and that was really valuable. I remember we would go on like field trips for lack of a better word or, or go out into different communities and we would learn about the healthcare system there. Um, and that those are really valuable to me. You can read about a healthcare system and you, we all know that they're very different, um, but when you're actually there and seeing members of that country talk about their healthcare system and any issues they have or like their strengths of the system, it, it's really interesting. So I, I definitely consider that. Um, an important experience in my journey. And I, again, I would, rec I would recommend anyone who has the opportunity to, to jump into that. That is really awesome. And this was in Italy, I'm guessing. Yes. So it was in um, Reggio Emilia, which is Northern Italy. Okay. Okay. That, that, that sounds amazing. And that's awesome that they offered courses in public health as well. That is amazing. And it's, it sounds really cool because you said like other public health students from around the U.S. Uh, coming and going and, and going to those places. When in your schooling did you go to that? Go, go there. So I actually spent my last semester of undergraduate abroad, um, which is, I guess if you were to go earlier on in your college experience, you may have the opportunity to take more general classes that aren't focused on your major. Um, however, I was, again, choosing this program because they offered classes for my major, and that's what was left for me before graduation. Um, and I, I would suggest that people who, who go abroad, even if you're not going to take all of your courses um, in your major, I would suggest taking one or two, because I do think that it's beneficial. And then, so you're studying abroad, and after this, you got your Master's of Public Health in, at, at the University of New England, but like, tell me about that thought process. You're abroad, are you thinking about jobs? Are you thinking just about a Master's of Public Health program? What, what are your thoughts then? Yeah, good question. I think I, I was thinking about all of those things. Um, I was thinking about, do I want to get uh, a master's degree? If so, do I want to concentrate in something specific in public health? Do I want to take the route of working right away and looking to start my career and then later visiting school? Um, I think that those are questions and thoughts that a lot of students have. So I actually decided to, to combine those thoughts. Um, I started my master's program at the University of New England, and I did that master's program online. Um, and that gave me the opportunity to start my first job outside of undergraduate, which was um, a health educator at Morristown Medical in Northern New Jersey, um, or formerly known as Atlantic Health System. So I was, I was completing both of those at one time. And that was it, definitely a, bu a busy time in my life because of that, but I, I think it's important to mention that um, I find a, I found a lot of value in doing an online master's program. I at first was skeptical, thinking I might not have the same experience that I would in person. Um, however, looking back, I was really happy that I was able to start my career earlier on rather than waiting another year um, if I were to be in person in school. I didn't concentrate in anything specifically in my master's. Um, I just 
got a general uh, MPH. And that's another uh, thing I find value in. I think that concentrating in something is great um, because you become an expert in whatever you're concentrating in. But I think one of the benefits of public health is that it's so broad and getting a, a general MPH still makes you think, okay, I have all of these opportunities. You know, the opportunities are limitless. And I left there feeling that I had taken classes similar to those I took in my bachelor's degree, however, at a higher level, and I really strengthened my writing skills through my master's program. Okay, firstly, before I forget, what does that higher level look like? Or like, can, can you explain like a student in their bachelor's degree is thinking about doing their master's, but they don't know what like that def difficulty level is gonna be like, help, help them? Sure. So I think it, higher level, just um, in terms of the, the content and as well as how quickly the classes go. My program was a year and a half. You spend four years undergraduate. So those classes, looking back, they felt that they were moving at a slower pace than my graduate class was. And I think that that's what I mean by high, higher level. Essentially, I think you just, you know, you need to keep up with the content. It would be easier to fall behind in graduate classes than it would undergrad, in my own opinion. But with that being said, I, I really enjoyed how my graduate classes focused on the writing. There's less tests, there's less quizzes. Um, and again, that focusing on writing and strengthening my writing skills has really helped me in my career. I think that was one of the most valuable things that I can take from my master's program. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think that writing skill is just because it's, it's like you're going to use it in all different settings. So being able to, to use it and be effective in your communication as well as just being able to know how to write about different things and, and like synthesize data or whatever the case might be is just hugely, hugely beneficial. So, so that's awesome. Absolutely. So tell, tell me about the process. So you, you're abroad, you come back, you graduate in Charleston, you go home to New Jersey, and then you get the job and then apply to MPH or you get into the MPH program and apply to the job? What's that process? They happened in a very close time frame. the um, starting my master's program and starting my first um, career. So I think that I had my first job. Um, I think I had been in maybe half of a semester of my master's program um, and then started at Atlantic Health. So it was a very... Um, it was a very close timeline. And again, that, that is why I chose to go online because I thought to myself, um, I can still apply to these jobs and know that I can be doing my schoolwork when I'm not physically at work. Okay. So it was, yeah, I would say it was in a month or two of each other. Okay. Makes sense. Thank you for clarifying for me. Um, so was the online MPH also two years or was it a one year online MPH? So I believe that, and I'm sure it's different for every program, I believe that students definitely have flexibility in how long they, how long or how short they want to complete the program. I chose to do the fast track and I completed it in one and a half years. Okay, okay, thank you for sharing that. So what were your duties at Atlantic Health? What kind of stuff did you do? Yeah, so um, at Atlantic Health, I worked as a health educator and I worked in the community health department. It was a really interesting experience and I definitely learned a lot from it. Being in the community health department, we were meeting the needs of the local community there. So a lot of the work that we focused on was education for the community. We focused on prevention of chronic diseases. We would attend things like health fairs or um, different community health centers and of course, you know, different initiatives that exist within the actual hospital I was working for. But being a health educator, I think, is a really um, interesting career track for people who may also want to see the clinical side of things and the community side of things. So I say that because I worked a lot with nurses and physicians when they, they would go out into the community and they would provide screenings for community members. And then the health educators would help along their side to provide education for for those community members. So it, it was, it's an interesting way to, again, network and collaborate um, with different people who have different roles in the healthcare system. Yeah, and what is also awesome is that you probably 
like getting all this real world experience and different things happening and then you're reading about it in the MPH program and you're talking and you can reflect on like actual experiences that you're having and how that relates which also just helps to solidify everything that you're leaning in in a, in a more practical way so so that was a great thing there and another thing uh, to mention is we also worked a lot with community health workers um and I really enjoyed that so much. Community health workers are amazing. I give them so much credit. They're underutilized in the public health system and they're, they're so essential. It was interesting, again, just to just sit back and see their responsibilities and their duties. And I think the, it, it, it shows the strength in the various careers in public health. You know, you can become a health educator, you can become a nurse, a physician, a community health worker. And at the end of the day, you're, you're serving your community and it's it's amazing. It's amazing to work with all of those different roles. I, I really enjoyed it. During your MPH program, and also while you were working as a health educator throughout that time, you also had a couple uh, internships. So the first one was a public health intern at West Africa AIDS Foundation or WAF or WAAF. Uh, so how how did you get that? And then what do you do in it? Sure. So um, similar to my experience studying abroad, this internship at WAF was really great because, again, I got to learn about the healthcare system in a different country. I applied to that internship online through LinkedIn, um, and they have interns who are there um, on the public health level and then also interns who are getting clinical hours. It was really great to be able to work on the grants that they had on the community level there, and also um, we did a lot of work in the community. So we went out and provided free STI screening and testing to more remote areas of Ghana. And I really learned a lot from the nurses that I went out with to do that. You learned about collection of data of, uh, based on those screenings. And then as well, we would refer people back to the clinic. And I also was able to shadow and learn from other health educators there um, about uh, the education that they would provide to the patients that they were referring. Okay, that was awesome. And it, that's cool that you got to do both this and then the, uh, the study abroad in Italy, which is, which is awesome. Are there any like takeaways from that? Like just being able to immerse yourself as a student or like before you're like actual professional professional and going to these different countries and experiencing like public health work there. Are there any takeaways you wanted to share? Absolutely. I mean, I think that interning at WAF specifically helped me find an interest in the health education field and community outreach. I think I may have been interested in that without the experience, but it, it was helpful to get the hands-on experience and see, okay, what would an average day be like in this position? It might not be exactly the same in one internship as it will in um, a career path that you'll take, but I would say that's why internships are helpful because you get to learn what you do like and what you don't like. And it's almost like a, a trial run before you get to start your career path. And, and I, I certainly find that helpful. I even wish that sometimes now I, I could do that. I wish that I could go out and, and learn about different, different fields in public health. I think that it, it's definitely really valuable, again, if you have the opportunity to get hands-on experience and just listen to um, and and learn from others and their own experiences in those fields. Absolutely. You sound exactly like me, um, saying that you got to get out there and get those internships to, to know what you like and what you're doing. Like, is this absolutely just like that? Because you're not going to find out any other way. Absolutely. Okay. And then during this time, you also had a M uh, you had you were MPH intern at the American Academy of Pediatrics. So tell me, how, how do you get that and what are you doing I chose to intern at the New Jersey chapter of American Academy of Pediatrics, and that internship, I would say, was, was definitely more office-based compared to my other internships with WAF or, you know, even studying abroad where I was seeing, you know, different healthcare systems. So I wasn't, again, of course, we're focused on the U.S. healthcare system here, but uh, again, I think that it was just really helpful to, to learn about people who were in those positions. So I, I did get to go to different conferences with my preceptor, um, and that was helpful. We, we focused specifically on ACEs. Um, they were doing ACEs screenings and, and studying ACEs, which is adverse childhood experiences. And that really opened my eyes to trauma-informed healthcare, which I'm still very passionate about, and I still find 
really interesting. So essentially, I, I was in that position to complete my capstone, and um, I was able to get the hours I needed, and I made networking connections. Again, it, it gave me all of what internships should give you, um, and, and that was really helpful. Yeah, that's awesome. And, and I think it's, it's good to like highlight that you said you got into this, and then you found the experience with ACES and like trauma-informed work, and now that interests you more because you got some experience in it. And as you said, as we said earlier, like you got you got to do it to know if you like it or not. Um, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, so you you're doing your MPH online. You have your health edu- educator position. You're doing these different internships at different times. How did you manage your time? Yeah, I, I I look back and I'm not sure how I did how I managed it. Um, no, I, I think that it's just like anything else. It's just prioritizing each day, taking it day by day. Um, I think that all students know that that it just feels like there's not enough hours in the day sometimes, but but you, you get through it. And I think that it was helpful to have so many different moving parts at once. It's really helped me with my time management skills in my current position. You know, now I'm in a place where I'm not in school anymore. I essentially, my main focus is my job, which is a nine to five job. However, looking back at my past, I'm, I'm helpful that I gain those skills to prioritize the different projects that I have for my own position. So it, it was a learning experience doing all that. Um, I think the online component certainly helped. I give a lot of credit to people who are working and in school in person, but but I, would, I wouldn't change anything about it. Okay, and, and do you have any like, tools or techniques that you use to prioritize like projects and things like that or not not so much i'm i'm a huge calendar person as as simple as it is just you know writing everything down on a calendar in one document to do lists there's a lot of joy in crossing things off you know i like to use any resource and tools that are helpful to schedule and prioritize your time calendar is the main one for me fair enough simple and effective exactly <laughs> And, uh, did you have any other takeaways that, that you had um, through your MPH program that you wanted to share? Yeah, I think another thing that I really enjoyed about my MPH program was learning about, again, about different people's positions. So online, a lot of the uh, online programs focus on a discussion board. So you have a discussion board for every week or every two weeks and you answer and then you can comment on other people's posts. And it was interesting to see the various places that people were at in their careers. We had people who had worked in, you know, a career for 10 years, and then they decided to get an MPH, and then they talk about what they're focusing on. Then you had people like me who decided to go into your MPH, you know, soon after your bachelor's degree. So I think I found that really, and, and that's something you would get in person or online. I just, I found it really interesting to learn about other people and, and where they were in their careers and um, and just their experiences. Like, because when you think of a career track, you always think that it's something that's really linear. You know, I'm gonna start here, I'm gonna go A, B, C. And learning about other people makes you realize that it doesn't happen like that at all. You know, one opportunity leads to the next. And for me, as, as a younger professional, I, I find that really helpful because I think that people can put um, pressure on themselves and thinking that they have to, be moving from one step to the next. And, and again, that's just not, that's not how it works. Yeah, absolutely. I absolutely agree with that. And I think that that's so important to highlight because a lot of people do, do not know like how you go about getting or knowing how to get to where they want to be in public health. And it's funny that, that you talk about like discussion boards because a professor reached out to me and told me that um, someone, but who she's putting people in her program, her undergrad students in her, I think it's the American University or something like that. And they have to listen to six episodes of this podcast and write about it in a discussion board. So maybe your story will be highlighted. And, and as you said, you were happy to hear and learn about those different stories. And I'm very happy that you came on here to share and, and tell your story because it's, there are just so many different stories and you do learn that it's not a linear path. Exactly, yeah. And, and like you said, I think it's especially true in public health because it is such a broad field. I, I think that it, it, it may be for some people, they, they think differently that it's completely linear, but I actually find comfort in the fact that it's not. There's always, op- there's always something else you can involve yourself in, another opportunity. Yeah, and I, and I think the fact that 
you can build on a lot of transferable skills is also very helpful because then you could just take that over to whatever next side of public health you want to work in. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so you graduated, you said the timeline for your health educator job at Atlantic Health System was a similar timeline to your master's of public health. So what was that? Okay, you actually, I see that you freelanced here first, actually. So you were a healthcare public relations specialist at Comprehensive Care Centers. How, how, how did you go about like free freelancing? Yeah, so that that's a, yeah, something I never thought that I would stumble into. I created a relationship with a local OBGYN who was in the Morristown area who was looking for somebody to help with the social media and website of her practice. And I didn't necessarily have these tech or communication media skills that made me feel like an expert. However, I thought that it would just be a great opportunity to learn and a great something to put on my resume, et cetera. So I I went for it. And um, essentially, it is a freelance position because um, even though I've moved out of the New Jersey area now, I'm still able to do that position from home. So like I said, that mostly... I will do their Facebook and their Twitter, and that consists of using my health education skills and the skills that I learned in my master's public health program and uh, bachelor's degree. So providing women's health information to the general public since the social media, however, under the assumption that the patients and people who are local to that area are the ones who are consuming the information. Um, and I really enjoyed that. I would, I would, you know, I, I guess that's more of a specific niche, but I think that anyone who is interested in social media or like the tech side of things, public health is, is a great way to get into that field. Like there'll always be providers who are looking to have people, um, you know, respond to patient reviews and keep up with providers are so busy so that they really need that public relations skill set. And I've, I've, I've enjoyed it much more than I thought I originally would. I've, I've really enjoyed doing that. Okay, that's awesome. Is there any advice that you would give to someone that is looking for those type of opportunities? Yeah, I would say, you know, just just put yourself out there in terms of like what you're willing to learn. So I didn't know anything about building a website and I really learned from the skills of one of my, um, another man who just freelance and he, he taught me a lot about the skills to use word, like to create WordPress and such. So I would say, you know, just put yourself out there in terms of what you want to learn. And then also just, there's definitely people who I think, enjoy freelancing more than others. Um, and I'm, I'm only doing it with one organization, but somebody who's super interested in it could definitely market themselves um, to, to work for multiple organizations and really become an expert in the social media and the website and the managing provider profile aspect. So I, I highly suggest it to somebody who's interested in that. It, it is very nice that you said that like you went into this and you didn't know how to do it and you figured it out while while you were doing it. And I think that that's very, very important. Like take those chances on things that you don't know. For example, on like on my side, I built out my entire the phmillennial.com website. And that was all from just like YouTube <laughs> research right. and just hours of waiting. And it was it was hard. I would I would say that I don't if I would do it again, I don't know. But, <laughs> but, but uh, it's definitely been been with it. And I feel like even if I'm I can teach a lot of people about that those kinds of things that I know. I know enough to be dangerous, you know, and I think that that's important. Just getting these kind of weird skills that that you never know when would pop up and be important or useful to someone else. Absolutely. Well. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you for sharing that as well. And your current job is a program associate at ABIM Foundation. I think that's what you said earlier, not ABIM, ABIM. ABIM, correct. <laughs> okay, okay. Okay, good, good. Um, did you get this directly after graduating, before graduating? Did you have a period after you graduated and had to wait for a job? What was that process? So I had um, finished my master's in public health and accepted the offer at ABIM Foundation. And so ABIM Foundation stands for American Board of Internal Medicine. I applied for this position similar to other positions just by seeing a posting online. I was not familiar with the organization before. And when I read more about the job description, I thought that 
A, it was something I was interested in and B, I thought that I had transferable skills and I applied for that position and accepted it and moved to Philadelphia. I've been there for about two and a half years now or more, close to three. <laughs> okay, okay, that's awesome. And what, what, what was the application process? That, when, when did you start applying for jobs and, and all of that? Like, what was that process like for you? I, my application process for all of the positions I've had have been online. I haven't had any specific connections anywhere. I've just taken the initiative to research organizations and research positions in those organizations that I find interesting. So when I was finishing my master's and my time at Atlantic Health was coming to an end, I was looking at other positions. And as I said, you know, this, this position that I'm currently in was of interest to me. So I applied for that. So essentially I applied through LinkedIn. Um, I had an initial phone interview and then I went in person for an interview with the team members that I work with today. I was offered that position and that um, essentially created this transition to where I am in my career now. Okay, okay, that's awesome. Well, thank you for sharing that. What, what do you do in this position? And has, has your role like transformed as you've been there or has it pretty much been the same since you've started two, three years ago, two to three years ago? I definitely think that my role has transitioned in the time that I have started to now. Um, just like anywhere else, you know, you become more familiar with an organization and more familiar with its initiatives. And once you do so, you're able to involve yourself um, in, in more of those that are in, of interest to you. So um, when I first started, I worked primarily on the Choosing Wisely campaign, which is an international campaign to reduce overuse in healthcare, and um, still do some work on that campaign now, but have also incorporated other, other responsibilities into my job, such as planning for an annual conference that we host every year, and the, the work that comes out of that conference, and various initiatives that, that just happen, you know, as as time goes on throughout the year, there's just different projects. Again, as I talked about writing before, I've I've gotten myself involved in writing some newsletters for ABIM's Foundation's monthly newsletter. And I've really enjoyed that because it provides me with the opportunity to interview with people externally and learn about the work that's going on um, in different sc organizations, schools, different sectors of public health. And I really enjoy that. So I, I definitely think that my my job has transitioned since I've started. And you know, again, I think that's something that's really great about public health that you have your job description and you have your main duties, but it's fluid. You know, what what you work on will change. And I, I definitely think that there's always opportunity to speak up and say, hey, I'm interested in this. You know, can I learn more about it? And I, and I really appreciate that. Okay, and then tying back to your writing skills and you being able to be contribute to the newsletter that uh, AVIM Foundation does, was that onus on you or was that something that someone pushed upon you? Did you, like, tell me about that process of how you got to become on that team to do part of the newsletter or all of the newsletter, whatever part of the newsletter you do? Yeah, sure. So I, the, the communications um, team definitely does, you know, the work behind the newsletter various things that I can't speak to in terms of creating, you know, the, the schedule for what will be written. So there's certainly a team of people that do that. Um, but I did myself speak up and say, I would be interested in writing content um, for these newsletters. And my manager and other coworkers gave me that opportunity to do so. So again, I think, I think it's important to speak to what A, might challenge you and B, interests you yeah it's always great when you're able to integrate something you like into your job more more holistically so that's awesome and uh thank you for sharing that uh, i wanted to ask did do you have an interest did you have an interest in working in public health globally is was that something that that ever crossed your mind seeing that you did go to school in italy for a bit as well as work in um ghana Absolutely. Yeah, great question. A global health to me has always been so interesting. I mean, I think that every time I read anything that's in the global health sector, I'm just amazed. You know, I, I learned so much. I think even more than I do on the community level, I, I have more of an interest in, in global health. 
And I'd like to say never say never. Like maybe I'll find myself working in the global health sector. And I, I'm, I think I would really, I would really love that. The way that my career has, um, has played out, I haven't necessarily, other than the internships I've done, I haven't professionally worked in the global health sector, but, but I would love to. And, and I do, you know, see other public health professionals and students who do global health fellowships. And I would say that people who are really interested in global health and want to, you know, absolutely have a career in that track. I, I can't speak to something I've never done, but from what I've read and learned secondhand, I think that um, that's a great route is to intern with organizations who focus on global public health initiatives and problems, and then apply for, uh, apply for those internships, fellowships, opportunities to, to study and to work abroad that will provide you t- with the opportunity to make, make a more, uh, make a formal career out of out of those experiences. And yes, I, I absolutely find global health so interesting. Okay, that's awesome. And I do look forward to seeing if that is a transition that you make in, in the future or whatever that, that thank you. progression looks like. Oh, thank you. Thank you for coming on and sharing and sharing those thoughts and, and everything like that. And I think if people are interested in global health, I think Vanessa DaCosta was on one of my podcast episodes. Can't remember which, which number. Uh, definitely check that one out as, as well as uh, Taylor Deramo, I think she goes as Taylor underscore public health on Instagram. You can definitely check her out. She's an MPH student, but she does, she has heavy interest in global health and she has a lot of information around that. So awesome. Yeah, just some resources for everyone if they were interested. And uh, so after, well, no, I'm sorry. You, you're also a steering committee member at Public Health Young Leaders Association Network. So tell me how you get involved in this. Yeah. So, um, the steering committee is specific to the city of Philadelphia. I actually learned about the steering committee through my manager. She, she is not on it, but she made me aware of the organization. And essentially, um, Phila exists as a organization of young public health professionals. So they advertise different events, public health events that are going on that public health profession, young public health professionals are interested in, provide networking opportunities, career development. And um, I was really, just, I just thought, wow, like what a great organization. This should be, this should start even younger. Like this should start when there's students and have just more opportunities to connect with one another. Um, and with that being said, I just had a general interest and also moving to Philadelphia and not knowing um, many organizations here or many people professionally, I had made my connections in New Jersey. I thought that it would be a great opportunity to expand, expand my network. So I applied to be a member of the steering committee. Everyone who's on the steering committee serves a two year term. So I'm, um, I've been there for about a year and a half and I am the strategic partnerships lead. So I work with the other members to help create partnerships with the other organizations. And again, find out the events that those organizations have and um, connect with them, you know, have them promote what we're doing and we promote what they're doing. Uh, And it's been a great experience. I've really been able to, just for myself, learn about the organizations that exist in Philadelphia and all the events that are going on, all the great work that's being done. And then, you know, larger than that, feel like I'm hopefully contributing uh, to the committee in creating connections to other organizations. Okay, and tell me more about that process. So you're the partnership lead, which means that you're trying to connect to other organizations. How do you do that? Is it through social media? Is it through like word of mouth or going to certain meetings and meeting people there? What's that like? Well, I will say it's definitely been more of a challenge with COVID. Um, So I think if people were meeting in person more frequently or as we were before COVID, it, it may have been more in-person interactions. But based on the circumstances, a lot of the initial meets were simply done through email. So researching organizations that are local to public health organizations local to Philadelphia. And of course, there when I came on, there was various connections that existed already, I wanted to just create more. And so based on what already existed, seeing who aren't we connected with, like who who can we connect with, who's who's doing work that we don't know about, and just generating a list um, from that research and simply just 
emailing people and saying to them, hey, this is Phila, this is who we are, this is why we exist, and this is what we offer, um, and then hearing what they have to offer. And from there, you know, if, if they're interested in connecting, I would schedule a Zoom meeting with myself and then any other Phila uh, members who are interested, and we would give them information about the committee. And then just after that, it's, it's a matter of staying in touch and making sure that those connections are, that they stay alive. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I was gonna ask you something. What was I gonna ask you? I can't remember. <laughs> Take your time. <laughs> oh, I was gonna ask, is there a filler in, are there chapters like in different states or is it Philadelphia specific? Or are you so, not sure? So um, Phila is Philadelphia specific. I don't believe that Phila exists anywhere else. Like there's no sister chapters or mm -hmm. for, you know, um, that are directly correlated, but I'm sure that in other cities, similar organizations exist. I think it would be a great opportunity if, if it was more formal in the sense of that this exists in, in various cities and, and then you're connected all those are connected to one another. Like I think it would, especially on the East Coast where things are so closely related in proximity, I think it would be great to hear like, oh, here's this New Jersey chapter, New York chapter, Philadelphia chapter. And yeah, and so I think that there's there's opportunity there for anybody who has an interest in that to connect the organizations with each other. Absolutely, I definitely think as an opportunity, if someone is interested in doing that, that's actually literally something that you can do. Uh, so thank you for absolutely. Sharing that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, so before we move on to the Furious Five, I just wanted to ask you, where would you like to see yourself in the future? So I, you know, similar to what we had talked about before, how there's oh, it's not necessarily a linear path. I just hope that in the future, I continue to take the opportunities that are presented to me. I want to continue to grow my network, to grow my skill set, and then hopefully in a few years down the road, find something that I can specialize in, in public health and find, you know, really an interest in and then, um, and then move forward with that. <laughs> awesome. Well, th thank you for sharing that. Uh, I appreciate it. I look forward to following along on the journey and seeing where, where it does take you. Um, so moving you on to the Furious Five, the five question I ask all guests. Number one, what advice would you give to a student trying to pursue a career in public health? The advice that I would give is to say yes to the opportunities that are presented to you and learn what you don't like because that will help you learn what you do like. And subsequently, I would also say to just continue to ask questions, talk to the people in your network, um, ask them about their journeys and wherever your journey takes you, continue, just continue to ask questions. Good advice. Number two, if you were talking to someone wanting to get into your position, what advice would you give them? My answer would be similar to what I had said for public health students. Um, I would say just build your skill set. Um, as we talked about before, I think writing is really important in public health, whether you are going to be grant writing or in, in, in any other type of writing for data. I think it's absolutely important. Put yourself into a research environment to see if you're interested in that. Um, and also to learn the healthcare system, learn how it works and learn about the clinical side of healthcare, learn about the community side of healthcare. And as we talked about throughout this, if you have the opportunity to learn about global healthcare, take any opportunity to go out and have internships just, just really think of yourself as somebody who can take on any opportunity um, and, and do it. Great, great, great advice. Um, number three, what's something you're working on improving in your life right now? As a professional, I think something I'm working on is celebrating my successes. I think it's really easy to um, get hung up on a mistake you make or things that you have to improve on. And I think that we, you know, we can all do that. So I personally am trying to work on celebrating what I'm good at and my successes rather than focusing on what I need to improve. 
yeah that, that, that is a that's actually really great advice and i think like just focusing on that like affirming all the great things that you've done and all, and all the great things that you like you've accomplished to get to where you are today is a, is a beautiful way so yeah i appreciate that one not, thank not you a, yeah not a common one that we get but, <laughs> but nice. uh, number four professionally do you recommend anything yeah, so I actually have recommend a book um, called 101 Careers in Public Health, and that's by Beth Seltzer. That, it, there may be um, a new version of that book or something that I think it's, it's slightly old, but essentially what it does is goes through 101 Careers in Public Health and really outlines what you need to get each career, what you would be doing in that job you know, like how you can get there, the salary, just really bullet point things about each job. I found that really helpful. Um, I remember going through that book and just highlighting what I would be interested in. And to this day, I I still look at it just to learn about different career tracks. So I, I would highly suggest that book. And similar to this podcast series, I would just, you know, any sort of public health podcast or online literature it will expand your knowledge and your interests and, and anyone that you resonate with or, or find interesting to listen to, I would suggest that. Okay. Yeah, that, that is great advice. And I actually have not, well, I might have heard of that book before because I don't know, I've been asked to be on a book similar to that. I don't know if okay. it's the same person. I think it's a, a revitalized version. So it might be that exact book, but um. I don't, I don't know. I can't remember the lady's name that reached out to me for it. But yeah, I definitely think that 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 will be hugely beneficial. And I think I want to get that just to see like what what she does recommend, because it seems like she does talk to a bunch of different people from uh, all hosts of fields in public health. So that's awesome. So thank you for recommending that. And last but not least, where can people connect with you? Uh, so you can connect with me on LinkedIn. My name is Kate Carmody again, um, and I'm always happy to connect with anyone on LinkedIn who's interested uh, in, in chatting about anything in terms of public health. So definitely connect with me if you're interested. Awesome, awesome. And I will be sure to put your profile, LinkedIn profile in the description as well as the podcast show notes. So be sure to check that out and connect with Kate if uh, you are interested, which you should be. Um, but thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story. And I know this is going to be very helpful to a lot of people in their career path. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. I've, I've really enjoyed talking with you. Well, I'm glad to hear that. And uh, some housekeeping items, everyone. Be sure to subscribe, to leave a review, to like this, to share with a friend. And if you want to support, you can go to buymeacoffee.com. And we got some exciting things coming in the pipeline soon. So look out for that. See you all next week.